So every day we see more and more articles and videos about why you should come back to the office. I found a video today that I want to show you from a YouTube channel called HR Party of One. This video is titled Returning to the Office. What are you afraid of? According to several recent studies, the retention tension that is the great resignation has been largely influenced by problems of company culture. Or was it being overworked and underpaid and underappreciated? Or do you just want to count that as culture and not say the difficult real reasons? So it's important to consider how your current work model is affecting your work culture. For example, onboarding is foundational to culture building, but doing it remotely doesn't do justice to the process or the new hire. You can't speak in absolutes like that. Are you the candidate? Do they feel like it's fair? Companies can adapt their onboarding for new hires if they're remote. Workers are social animals and they learn how to work by example, just as much as by doing. Are you saying that they can't do that? remotely because clearly you can share your screen and get on video um, and then you move on to talking about but many remote workers have no idea how long it should take but workers have no idea how long it should take them to complete a particular task so this sounds like poor management it doesn't sound like remote work is the problem it sounds like communication is unclear especially if they're new to a position even with daily check-ins and constant collaborative communication what other team members are doing or more importantly how they're doing it is a bit of a mystery when you're not occupying the same space. Okay, and what's the problem with that? As long as the results are there, the output is there, the satisfaction of the people above you are there, your work quality is there, why do you need to see the how? For example, when Bernie Portal went remote in March of 2020, we noticed an overtime creep among non-exempt team members. The same tasks that took them 40 hours a week to complete in person would often take them 50 or even 60 hours a week remotely. Pause for a second. She's overcomplicating this. Exempt versus non-exempt. What she's saying is salaried workers versus hourly, non-salary workers. And she's saying that the hourly workers, when they went remote, they started charging more hours and we have to pay overtime and that's expensive for the company. And I'm going to destroy this argument in a second, but let me play the rest. Overtime is compensated at one and a half times their regular hourly rate. Remote work was costing the company significantly. Time theft doesn't have to be intentional to be costly. Um, you'd think any responsible, any mature company would have managers in place to approve overtime. I'm sure most of us are familiar with having to get overtime approved for situations like this. And then second, if your employees are obviously manipulating the system of remote work, fire them. Don't lean into it and be like, well, you ruined it for everyone because our hourly workers were seemingly dishonest. And she just mentioned time theft, so I assume that's what she's trying to say there. But of course, intentional time theft is costly too. What about all the time theft that companies are guilty of? It's when the company says, hey, can you stay for an extra 10 minutes and close and help me clean up, but you're not on the clock? They add up. And that time theft is way more than employees doing this. You've likely heard the stories of remote workers holding two full-time jobs at once. There are even websites giving workers tips on how to do it. While it may not be illegal, it's inefficient and dishonest for employers to get half an employee's attention for the full price. Number one, I'd like to point out that most business owners are actively invested in multiple businesses, but you as the employee aren't allowed to work for anyone but them. Now, let's talk about... <laughs> What she said after that, it's it's not fair for the employer to pay if they're only getting half of your attention. Are you paying for attention or are you paying for work getting done? Are you paying for results? Are you paying for the satisfaction and the quality of the work? As a salaried employee, you have no incentive to do more and more and more and more work and work faster every single time because you're, you won't typically get rewarded for that. You'll just be rewarded with more work. So what do you do? You gotta go get a second job, some other form of income, and then you get the work done. And if everyone's happy at both places, then what's the problem? I mean, go ahead, guilt trip workers for hustling. Personally, I would, I would work as many jobs as possible. And then if you don't like one, quit it. Now you have the other ones and then you can leverage whatever you want. You have the power for once as the employee when you have multiple jobs and employers they don't like that, so you're not allowed to have leverage. Just just the executives, okay? The only thing I see here that could get in the way is a non-compete. If you're working directly for a competitor at the same time, you know, that's probably not going to be good. Another problem that may be hiding in plain sight is turnover among top talent. If you're not tracking retention metrics or paying attention to employee feedback, it can be easy to overlook how many remote workers are leaving your organization to return to the office elsewhere. Wait, are you saying that secretly there might be a bunch of people in your organization that are currently working remote begrudgingly and they're leaving to go to other companies to go back to the office. I feel like that is the rare case. 
Long before the pandemic, experts were noticing that a loneliness epidemic was quietly growing in the US. Of course, COVID lockdowns, quarantines, and social distancing only exacerbated the problem. Many remote workplaces tried to recreate the camaraderie of the in-person office and found the experience underwhelming to say the least. So you're using a generic study that says Americans are lonely. And then uh, now we're taking that into the office and talking about you know, solve your loneliness by coming back to work. I've said it before. I'll say it again. You can be alone in a room full of people. Work isn't the only answer to socialization. And when companies push this garbage, it just makes my blood boil. If I want to hang out with you at work, I will let you know. Simply put, returning to the office can improve the social and mental health of workers who feel isolated and alone. The office environment also encourages more physical activity as employees move around and engage with coworkers. Yeah, so that's why you should you should drive all the way back because you might be able to move around more at the office. That's not a that's not a good reason you can do all of that at home. Perhaps less surprising, working together can increase workers' efficiency, productivity, and collaboration. The momentary interactions of the in-person office shape how we work for the better. This is this has been this has been disproven time and time again. I even made a video on it. People actually interact less when you force them to come into an open office. In fact, the office experience that so many of us have taken for granted is actually the envy of many recent college graduates who haven't yet had the opportunity. Last year, the Society for Human Resource Management, or SHRM, reported that 64% of the class of 2021 want to work on site most of the time or full time. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. 64% of people are willing to do whatever it takes to get a salaried position and not be a broke college student. That's how I read that. I just, they don't know what they want. How can you know? It's your first job out of college, you know? Chances are they go on YouTube and they watch Dan the Life of My Prestigious Six Figure Job and think, oh, that's what I want. I want to go to a startup office. I want to work 13 hours a day and sleep at work. That sounds awesome. It's really cool when you're getting into that world as a broke college student. It's exciting at first. And then, uh, you know, after a year or so, six months, three months, depending on how much you hate corporate, you start to realize, can I at least go home and do this shit? We had to decide not only whether or not to return and when, but also figure out how to do so as smoothly as possible. We used the Kepner Trigo method, a decision analysis process. This is classic HR, overcomplicated and completely unnecessary. The Kepner Trigo, just a sit rep. How much money did this company pay to learn these four steps? Probably like hundreds of thousands of dollars for this basic sit rep. Ultimately, we decided to return fully in person rather than in a hybrid work model, since fairness has always been one of our priorities. Wait, that sounds like the opposite of fair. We decided to make everyone come back to the office instead of allowing people to choose what works best for them. Hybrid work could not work the same for exempt and non-exempt employees due to FLSA re regulation. Can you specify those? FLSA regulations, lady, because I feel like there are a lot of companies out in the world right now that have hourly employees that are working remote and that also have salaried employees that are working remote. So why, why did your company have such a difficult time? Because it sounds like you're really reaching when you don't specify, because when I read these things here on the screen, I'm not seeing any real reason why you can't pay hourly workers at home. Lots of other companies are doing it. You could make this work if you really wanted it to, but you don't. You want to see what they're doing. You want to look over their shoulder. Overall, the transition went well. We did have a few employees resign rather than return. The turnover did not turn out to be devastating. It's clear that this video is not meant for employees because why would you say, as you can see, we brought everyone back to the office and we knew people didn't like it and we lost some people, but it wasn't as bad as we thought. So you're trying to tell other CEOs that are afraid of bringing their people in forcefully that, hey, look, we did it and it wasn't that bad. You can too. That's not a good look. Anyways, that's today's video. I'll keep fighting the good fight against the anti-work from home propaganda that we keep seeing. So if you have any videos you'd like me to take a look at, you can send them to me in the email. You can shoot me a Discord, Instagram, however you want to do it. Uh, but that's it. I hope you guys have a fantastic day and I'll see you in the next one.